The Spotlight Podcast is starting now. You never notice the trigger just how I react towards it. Let it die out just to piggyback off it. Tell me about myself and how I must attract all these things for the hell. But I never asked for it. Tell me what's your tactic trade? What gets you nasty? Let it die out just to piggyback off it Tell me about myself and how I must attract all these things for the hell But I never asked for it Tell me what's your tactic trade? What gets you nasty? What makes you feel some type of way? What makes you happy? Say more and speak less speak Then get back to me I kinda lost my step but It'll run back to me Speak Speed less, don't run back to me. Speed, speed less, don't run back to me. Speed, speed less, don't run back to me. Speed, speed less, don't run back to me. You're out there, you're listening to the sounds of Joe Craze. We're about to start in about 30 seconds, so stick around for the spotlight. I want you to get close, settle back for a great show. Because you don't notice the trick is just how I react to the same old shit. I just can't call it. Ain't you sick and tired of back and forth with a nigga? Yeah, I know, girl. The Spotlight Podcast is starting now. Please welcome your host, Joe Gray. Oh, we're back, baby. (laughs) We are back. (laughs) Round two, me and you inside of the spotlight. Yes, I got my man Don Warner back with me this week. He's going to dress it up, dress it down, tear it up, tear it down with some more innovative stuff, more history, you know, things that you haven't heard before, things that you haven't seen before. So sit back, relax. For those of you who were here last week, I know you had a good time because you told me. You called me in. You hit me up on uh, you know, all of the stuff, uh, the, 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 the uh, comments and everything. So, yeah, I really appreciate that, you know, with this new show. You never know. So, once again, I want you to call in. Uh, the number down at the bottom of the screen, 646-209-7946, uh, when I ask you to. Uh, I don't think we're going to do the ECAM thing tonight. Uh, I think that's a bit too much because we got a long show, so we're not going to get involved with that. But I do want you to call in when I ask you to, to ask Don some questions if you have them, okay? So uh, let's get it rolling. For those of you who were here last week, you probably saw this, but for those who are here for the very first time, we're going to give you a little bit about what Don is about. Here is what Don Weiner does.
try to give it away. is about to stare death in the face in the form of this imposing guillotine. Once used to behead dangerous killers, lawbreakers, and the wives of kings, the guillotine gained its gruesome infamy during the French Revolution. Oh no, he didn't get out. That wasn't supposed to happen. This is getting more grisly by the second. And now here are the secrets. That's the secret to not losing your head. Come on, sing it with me, y'all. I'm about to give you the course and the words. We about to turn it up in here. Turn it up. Gonna be the best song you ever heard. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Don Weiner. There he is. I'm not sure, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I, I think I just <laughs> you've earned it, brother. <laughs> I've written that in intro for uh, from comics and music acts over the years. So oh yeah, <laughs> well now it's, it's it's for you, and I'm proud to be the one to to say it to you, my brother. Welcome Thanks to the show again, it. Don. So, so sorry, my internet. The whole neighborhood died last week, right in the middle of the show, and yeah. I was having such a good time. And thanks for having me back. It was no, funny no look, looking at that clip with Steve and Cedric. Um, I, you know, I did his, I directed his talk show, Steve's talk show, right? And uh, we reconnected after many years. You know, we met when Steve was a warm-up comic. He originally was a warm-up comedian on Showtime with the Apollo. Right. He was the one that talked to the audience when we weren't taping, and right. he was so great. You know, on stage and as a comedian, we he. You know, we couldn't stop him from becoming a host. And about the second year um, that he was hosting and he was killing it and he was really growing, Steve was growing into his own. Mm -hmm. You know, he came to me one afternoon and said, when we were at the theater and said, you know, I've got a friend, I really want to do a favor for this young comedian. And he's my best friend and 
if we can get him on the show, that would be great. I said, yeah, what's his name? He said, his name is Cedric the Entertainer. Wow. And I said, your, your friend who's never basically <laughs> done anything. I didn't say that, but right. his name is Cedric the Entertainer. He must be, <laughs> you know, he must have confidence. Right. And he must be good. And we booked Cedric for the next taping and he killed, killed it. on the show. And uh, just that launched his career. But Steve, you know, Steve stepped in. And really, you know, he was the only person really, I think in those early days, at least, that he was really behind. And, mm -hmm. you know, Cedric was his buddy. But he also he knew that Cedric was so talented and just he was playing local clubs in the Midwest where, you know, where he was from. And and uh, Steve gave him his break, you know, yeah. and Cedric. So all these years, 30 years later, 30 plus years later, he's on the talk show with Steve. And I got to direct them again. And, and it was just a it was Fantastic. Great, a magical, yeah, because that moment was magical. I mean, I uh, with with Steve spelling that that word naked <laughs> out like that was just incredible, and just how I said you came in with uh, you know his part on that song. Did they create that song on the spot? Yes, Steve. No, Steve wrote it that day, and you know, Steve's he's an incredible musician, right? And right. I don't know, you hear him sing a little bit every once in a while, but right. he's really an amazing musician you put him down in front of a keyboard and you put a band behind, behind him, him yeah yeah and you got and he can just you know it just flies the right. creativity flies on right. it, of course you know it's all humorous but what, at least what, it, what he puts out to the public is humorous but he's right. a great he's a great musician you right. know it's just he's just you know got it in so many realms mm -hmm. just and those those are the things that, that that we never you know i mean having an opportunity to see him in that light because uh we don't, we don't, as a, as a, as the audience, don't get to see him do 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 that that much. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen his talk show a lot, you know, the, the recent one. But uh, I do know that there was one time um, he was singing, he, he was hosting, and I we, we were doing, I because I, I was singing with Ray and them at, at that time, and right. and uh, he was hosting and the band was playing Money Money Money, and I just went and I grabbed the mic from him, and as I was moving. The pieces on on stage. I had the mic singing "Money, Money, Money." Then he joined in with it. You know, it was crazy. It was just a great time. Yeah, those times at the Apollo were very special and and unique within itself because because of moments like that, because of of you allowing and you know that 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 entertainment environment to happen. Creativity, a lot of times, is very spontaneous, and for you to catch it and you know be a part of it, it's great. And especially, you know, and anytime you you're taping or doing a live television show, you've got parameters, you've got budgets, and you've got to make schedules, and you know, you're trying to keep things moving. And and the Apollo was a totally different experience for right. me because right. the Apollo audience decided what we were going to tape right. and when we were going to tape. Right, right. And all, so many times, what happened during the commercial breaks was so entertaining. And Steve would see someone in the audience and he would go out and pull them up on stage. And for the next 15 minutes, I knew, okay, let's stop. Right. We're not, we're not shooting for a while because yeah, you know, he, this is, this <laughs> you know him. Right yeah, yeah. The right. And we did something with, uh, when we came back and did Apollo live on BET, right. there was a night when Dougie Fresh was there. Correct. And I know you remember that night and he started during the break, a call and response with the audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 1,500 people were singing and rapping back to him. And Dougie is a master. And he was just the call and response working thing, the mic. Yeah. And it, right. was, it was literally 15 minutes of gold. That, right. And we ended up putting that in the show because it was so unique. And, and it, it, it just showed him off so well. But also, mm -hmm. it helped you really understand what that Apollo uh, audience and what that Apollo experience is. Because... It doesn't happen like that anywhere, anywhere else in else. the world. You're right. And, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm, do, do you do you kind of regret? Do, I'm sorry. Do you kind of regret not not taping those 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 moments in between uh, the well, shows with Steve? You know, we, we did we taped some of them. Some of them. Mm -hmm. But we taped when we did the show, especially in the Steve Steve era. Uh, he did it for s almost seven years, right? And seven seasons, and. Um, we get, we did four shows a night, as you remember. Right, of course, of course, <laughs> it was crazy. We would rehearse um, the music act, sound check the music in the mm -hmm. afternoon. One band per one, you know, one act per right. show. So mm -hmm. we sound checks for four, um, and that was about two hours. And then we, you know, we uh, let the audience in. The crew went to have dinner, 
And when we started taping around 6 p.m., we needed, before we could let the audience go home, we had to shoot four one-hour episodes, you know, within five hours or <laughs> wow. so. So wow. there was always a pressure to keep it moving because there right. was so much to get done. Exactly. And we ta- we, we roll tape on a, on a bit of it, but, but there was so much of it that we mm-hmm. literally did not have enough tape. Tape to keep up with that. All, yeah, yeah. all of it. I got it you. wouldn't have been you. enough to record yeah. the actual show itself. Right. And it was and sometimes... <laughs> so spontaneously with the audience that you'd be in a, you know, five minutes of a, of a reset and our warm up comedian would go out and before you knew it. And also the volumes turned down. So when I'm in a video truck on the, on 126th street and the right. volumes turned down, but what, was, I, what I can see on the monitors, like there's some mayhem happening right now in the theaters. Right. We turn the mics. So often it just caught us off guard. You right. know, we, we were, and, and, I think that's what made um, Showtime of the Apollo so special was that it was real. Right. You know, and, and what we tried to do was capture it, was to be, was to let the audience at home feel like they mm-hmm. were part of the audience. Part of the audience the theater. theater, yeah. And that, which is why, you know, Percy Sutton, this came up, this came up last week, Percy Sutton, um, his vision for the show and the reason he brought the Apollo back because the Apollo had, and I may repeat myself a little bit from last week. No problem, no problem. There are people who are here who who didn't hear you last week. That's good. Percy, you know, the the theater was inactive and um, Percy brought the theater back. And it was his his love for the theater and his vision for, you know, America needing the Apollo again. And, 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 you know, so when, when, when we, connected and and he created that show it was out of his personal experience you know percy sutton the chairman mr sutton right. i've always i've never <laughs> called him percy he's always <laughs> the chairman or mr sutton he's just one of those people that you you have so much respect, respect for, for yeah, that, yeah. Uh, with all he accomplished in business um in his whole entire life. I mean, mm-hmm. he's, he's, he needs, we need to do a movie about of course. Mr. Percy. Yeah, yeah. His That's, life true. Was, That's true. That's true. Unbelievable. But um, when I, the first time I got to sit with him to talk about the show um, way before the pilot, way before, um, you know, he, he reminisced about the impact that it, that being at the theater as a young man, his young person and then a young man had on him. And, um, and it was, even though at that point, the Apollo was just reopening. So there weren't a lot of show live shows. So I wasn't able to really spend a lot of time in the theater understanding it myself. So I was sitting at the foot of the master who was mm. telling me these stories about, um, you know, about sitting in the theater and, and as a as a young man, and when the lights would come down, mm. and he knew the show was about to start, um, and he said every show started with, "Ladies and gentlemen," as the lights were fading down. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's showtime at the Apollo. Wow! Now here's, and then the announcer would start the show. But and Percy said, Mr. Sutton said, "We we have to. We're going to call the show. It's showtime." at the Apollo. Right. And back then my first reaction was, wow, I'm thinking that's a really long title. <laughs> that's a really, how do you put that in a graphic? Cause right. most shows, most of this type star search, right. You know, the one voice. word, one word titles. So I, 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 but, but I heard him and I heard his passion and mm-hmm. I under, understood that. Okay. That was coming from um, a real place for him. It's his theater. He's he's gifting it back to, you know, all of us. So we're right. putting it on television for the first time, and I think maybe my contribution early on was I listened mm-hmm. and I heard him and I understood that what he was saying and what he felt, you know, what he felt, you know, kind of at his core, um, is what we needed to do exactly. because this was not just another. We weren't remaking another show this is there had never been a showtime at the apollo right and if we 
um, stay true to the vision and help it come to life, then maybe we can do something special. And even, you know, he said that, he said back in the, in the old days, the, 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 the music would, would start and then the most beautiful dancers would come down the aisles elegantly and they were, they were, you know, vaudeville. They was like, it was like the best of vaudeville, right, the right. best. And they had these feathers yeah. and, and, you know, as he described it, and that's the sh every that's, show opened. Right, right, with that. With the girls, with the feathers, because that was the vision that Mr. Sutton had. Wow. And that was what he remembered. And he wanted to be sure that we infused Showtime of the Apollo with not just the history, but to be proud of the history and exactly. to embrace the history, exactly. and make it part of a modern show. And um, I think that input, normally as a television producer, especially when you're creating something new, um, you're making it up. Right. You're, think, you're thinking, wow, well, what would be what would be a good name? What would be a good mm -hmm. format? What would be a, you know, but in this case, Mr. Sutton knew the Apollo. Right. And he brought the Apollo back for a reason. And he was very specific with his memories and, and very specific with what he wanted the show to be. And, um, you know, we, we, we grabbed hold of that vision and tried to do our best to make it come to life. And, and, uh, it was, you know, I, I was, I was a kid back then, you know, I was in my late twenties and had, I'd done a couple things, but really what Apollo was the first, um, the first show that really, that I was really, I was really passionate about right. and I felt really, uh, a part of, and, and, you know, when, when we went out to try to sell it, I think that having, um, having those types of um, stories to tell and um, the, the amazing history, the legacy of the Apollo theater and all the great stars it created and we're bringing it back, or, but we're bringing it to America and the world for the first time. It made it a lot easier to yeah. sell the show right, because right. people got it. Gotcha. People understood it and there had been nothing like it ever. Yeah. Yeah. Soul Train was on. Soul Train had been on, and that was people said, "Oh, you're just like Soul Train." Like, no, mm -hmm. no, no, we're not. We're not Soul Train. <laughs> That's own. Soul Train has its own place in history. Right, which is right. amazing. Um, but the Apollo, you know, predates everything in entertainment, it, <laughs> and it's influenced. I don't say everything, but you know, it, it's influenced so much of the Apollo Theater, um, uh, just our American pop culture and music and. You know, the Apollo was always first. And, you know, the stories I heard early on were, you know, Buddy Holly was one of the first acts, non-African-American acts to get booked at the Apollo because mm -hmm. he used to come and sit at the Apollo and watch and listen mm -hmm. and, and, and take it in and right. learn from exactly. the entertainers mm -hmm. and the songwriting and, mm -hmm. the, and you know, the, from the Rolling Stones to the Beatles when they first came to New York. I mean, uh, all of these... and. They, and they were more, it was in some ways more known, I think, in, in with the British audience and of with course. the British yeah. entertainers than, than in, to a lot of us in the yeah. U.S. And the Brits came over and just took it all in, mm -hmm. you know, and learned from the Apollo. And Apollo was doing things that no one had ever seen on stage before. And uh, it was pioneering, you know, genres of music. And, you know, I feel very lucky that I was there in the, in the eighties when rap music was just starting. Yes. And I yes, think that was one reason yes, why yes. we also got to make a mark for ourselves is that nobody was putting on and Johnny Carson was not putting on hip hop. Right. At you know, on NBC at eleven thirty at night. Right, there was right. there there were very few outlets for this music that was really sweeping the country. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we convinced everyone to come, come on in, and they all, and there was a, there was a love and a respect for the Apollo Theater right, and course. the legacy. Yeah, so getting, yeah. you know, getting the acts, um, getting the acts who were the biggest names in music at that mm -hmm. point to come mm -hmm. was not a big no deal. Yeah, and we yeah. also were able to, because we did twenty four shows a year, um, take a chance and bring on 
a lot of acts that were just starting mm -hmm. that were, you know, we got to introduce a lot of music acts on the show because that was kind of the Apollo's legacy was right. they broke, they made stars mm -hmm. at the Apollo. So if you can make you know, it there, you can definitely make it anywhere. Know that, you know, it was, it was uh, not just run DMC and it was not just, but, you know, we broke Mariah Carey. Yeah. We introduced to America for the first time yeah, on yeah. television. LL Cool J, LL Cool J with, with the boxing no. ring. Yeah, yeah. LL yeah. Cool J. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and what the artists knew um, was that first the stage was hallowed ground. And just to step on stage at the Apollo mm -hmm. for an artist is, for most art artists who, who get it. Who, right, of who, course, of course, know, of course. History, you'd watch the artist step on stage, and you could almost see the the, the mm -hmm. energy flowing. Right, right, and, right. And, and, and um, they knew that that you know they had to come with it. They had to perform. They knew that the audience was was notorious for not putting up with you know Any, anything less than greatness. <laughs> anything less than greatness. I remember uh, 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 just a second. Um, who's that? Um, now I forgot his name. Bruce Springsteen performed at the Apollo. Gave a great show. And after the show, came down from his dressing room and stood on stage right for about 10 minutes just watching the empty just stage. Watching. Yeah, just watching and taking it all in. Now you spoke about, about Brother Percy Sutton in such a great way. I gotta, you know, maybe people don't know exactly who this man is, so check this out. Someone told me the other day that I was a millionaire. And I said, you mean that I have millions of dollars of debt? Uh, I'm not self-made at all, really. I come from a family that was in business in Texas. We were in the funeral parlor business. We were in the burial business, uh, burial insurance. We were in the mattress making business. We were in the uh, skating rink business. And we were in farming. So I grew up in a family that was business oriented. Um, so that I had the exposure, and it's easy when, um, when you when you breathe the business before. It's true we didn't run a 500 company. Uh, um, we were not a, uh, in the 400 uh, top 400 uh, millionaires in America, but uh, we had good uh, business sense and uh, drummed into us by our mother and father, so that it was easy for me to go into business. And I mention this because so often we uh, blame black people for not being successful in business when we've never had the opportunity to be exposed. I think generations after this, my children, my grandchildren, my, all the people who work here with me, and this will be replicated by other black people all over the country. When you've had people who are your grandparents and your uncles, aunts, all in the business, you've seen it every day, you've talked at the table as we did as youngsters, it's easy. Then, As a matter of fact, right. shame if you don't go into business if you had all this exposure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then why the Sutton family and not the Jones family? And they lived on the same block, and they're both black. Why your Again, family? No, no, that's interesting because um, once in New York City, when someone was coming to the Board of Estimate, when I was a member of the Board of Estimate, President Board of Manhattan at that time, a black woman came, and she was supporting white people who were not for integration of housing here. And she said, I don't want those people living on my block. I work four days uh, uh, on what job, six days another job. She said, and I work 24 hours a day. And she went on to tell how difficult it was. Um, I said, Miss, I went through law school and graduate school working two full-time jobs, mm -hmm. 4 to p.m. until midnight at the post office, and then from 12.30 to 8.30 in the morning, I was a conductor on the D train. Then at 9 o'clock, I went to graduate school at Columbia. And then when I finished graduate school, I went to law school. And I did that. And then on weekends, I worked. I was a waiter on weekends. But the reason I was able to do that is because I had been taught as by a father and a mother that I was going to succeed. And I come from a climate. So what makes the difference? The difference was a father and a mother, and my father had a father. Mm -hmm. My father was born in slavery, but his father sent him to Texas with an older sister with money. Again, there was this culture that we came out of. So what makes the difference? Mm -hmm. When you're beginning and you've never had the experience, it's more difficult. But when you have a culture, a background of working, so what made it easy for the Suttons wasn't easy for the Joneses. So what I'm about now trying to make the Joneses mm -hmm. and others mm -hmm. interested and make it easy for them by giving them opportunity. Now, very frankly, 
in much of our business, I look at the uh, things that I'm doing, and I say, now, why am I at my age doing this? And the answer comes back to me, because I want to see something. I want to build an institution. I've lost more money than I've ever made. Um, I just finished, uh, this is ironic, for the Apollo Theater, I just guaranteed $16.9 million. And they gave me a thing to sign. I just finished signing it on Thursday of last week. It's called a keep well clause. I'm 65 years of age, and they're saying that I should keep this company in order until I'm 92. Well, obviously, I'm not going to do that, but the point is I was willing to sign it. I was willing to sign it because I wanted it to be an institution. In the course of doing that, I've lost a lot of money. I've lost a lot of money because instead of just making money for myself, I've gotten into other ventures, many of which have failed. Um, I, for example, had a small business investment company, and uh, we invested some $3.9 million. It wasn't much money, uh, but it was our money. Hmm. Uh, and we got matching monies from the SBA, uh, but we <coughs> lost it all. And only one venture succeeded. Now, why did we do that? We did it because we thought we ought to do it. It would get other minorities into business. We had Hispanics, we had women, and we had black people. And only one succeeded, and that's Bob Washington's. I shouldn't say only one succeeded. Only one is now in existence. Three of them were sold, not by us, but by people that we invested in. And uh, so I guess that you can consider them successful. Now, that was out of 17. <coughs> so the answer is that I believe so strongly that we would have, uh, that in the things that involve getting minorities into business, that we have invested in things that maybe good judgment would have dictated we'd not invest in. But I don't have any regrets. I think it was the right thing to do when I did <coughs> Someone told me the other day that I was a millionaire, and I said, no. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Great interview. Yeah, man. Oh, well, that's Mr. That was Mr. Sutton. I know I told the story last week, so I don't think I should tell it again necessarily. Yeah. But I got to witness, you know, how he operated, how he treated people, how he inspired, and how he led by example. Of course, you know, he was, uh, you know, he worked, and and when 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 your boss, you know, is inspiring and and leading by example, and he's mm -hmm. working, then you're you're working too. Of course, of course. It's and Mr. Sutton was that man. He yeah. was that man. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't. I'm. I. On Thanksgiving, I was reading. There was a Facebook uh, page a group that uh, is people. It was for people who worked on Showtime of the Apollo, and I. I found it and looked at it and flash back to this. I think the story. I think I told this story last week about. Um, well, tell it. Tell it again. Uh, yeah. Well, so we were just getting ready. The Apollo had been closed for a long time and, and he was overseeing the relaunch and the, the renovations and, you know, any, any theater, especially a theater that's you know, close to hundred years old, you need to maintain, you need to upkeep, you know, do the upkeep. And cause there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of foot traffic and audiences and artists backstage and moving sets. And so the, there's a lot to be done to just make the theater functional. Right. And uh, so, I know the Apollo was just on the kind of the way back. A lot of renovations have been done. We're getting ready to shoot the first show. And I was there on a, I think it was a, I don't know, late, late morning one day when we weren't working yet. Mm -hmm. I walked in the theater. I thought I was by myself. I was going to go up on stage, go upstairs, backstage, stage right to check out what the renovations, you know, look like for the dressing rooms. Cause the stage right is where the staircase leads up to the dressing rooms. Of course. Um, and so I walk backstage and again, I'm by myself, empty theater. Um, and I, I made the turn stage right. And Mr. Sutton was always dressed beautifully, you know, the most beautiful suits. He was always, the, the tie was always perfect. The, he was always just so put together, you know, and, and I saw him, I saw him standing next to a, a, a stack of boxes of floor tiles. And I said, hello, Mr. Sutton, what, what's going on? He said, well, they haven't had a chance to finish the stairwell yet. And, you know, he was checking things out, you know, before I got there and realized that, um, that the, the tiles hadn't been laid to his, you know, uh, specifications yet. They hadn't gotten around to it. And, and he said, um, 
uh, he said, I don't want the talent coming back to the theater and seeing the theater, I forget the exact mm -hmm. words, but basically undone, yeah. not, not presentable in his eyes. So he was backstage by himself. No one else was there. The crew didn't come in, I think, till noon or three or something in the afternoon back in those days. And he was getting ready to lay the tiles himself, wow. the floor tiles. He had a stack from, got it from Home Depot or whatever the store was nearby. And he, t he took off his jacket, rolled his sleeves up, and <laughs> I took off my jacket, <laughs> and I rolled my sleeves up, I put my bag down. And, you know, for the next, it's so, it's 30 whatever years ago. So it's, the recollection is a little fuzzy, but I remember getting down on my hands and knees and whether I was pulling the backs off and giving them to him or whether he was, yeah. we were tiling that floor. <laughs> and, and the fact that Mr. Sutton would not ask him for help, not complaining, mm -hmm. not, course, not yelling at anyone because it wasn't done. He saw something that needed to be done. And he did it. And he did it. Right, he was right, doing it. Right, right. And I and how could I not yeah. you know follow that example? And exactly. and as we laid tiles, I would and again it may have been thirty minutes, it may have been three hours, but he I got the I got you know, then when you're working with anyone like that, when you're working, whether you're home or wherever you are, and you're you're working together, the stories yeah. are you know, it's like family. You, right. you know, it's family easygoing and and he told me some stories about the apollo mm -hmm. his personal stories right right and, and that's ne i've never forgotten that day because here he is one of the you know most successful businessmen in new york you know he was president of the borough manhattan and he was very involved politically and, and has done these incredible things and he was he made a choice and he was leading by example, example, but he wasn't doing it for anyone else, but he was doing it for the Apollo. And he wanted the Apollo to to um, to have its coming out party and have on that beautiful dress. And he right. was, you know, he was doing it. He was right. taking it on right. his, right. his own right. shoulders. And that was that was per that was Mr. Sutton. I still when I'm with him, I right. used to call him Percy. Um, but but, uh, you know, that's just. That was That's the, who he, he, he is and who he was. Yeah, I got I got I got a small taste of that myself. He was he came to the theater one night and he uh, I would anytime he was there I would hang his coat uh, in my office and um, so I escorted him down through the green room as we were coming through the green room. I didn't see it, but he saw this piece of trash on the floor. He went over, picked it up to put it in the garbage, and I I thought to myself. I should have saw that, but <laughs> to to know that he took his time and, and 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 like you said, he was he had his suit on and tie and everything. But that's what he saw. He wanted to make. He still had that 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 motivation <clears throat> of yeah. making sure that that theater was was respectful and 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 and, and re, in a way presentable to everybody who came through there by doing that. And, and so so and so that every time that I would walk through that green room, I look for paper you know to pick up because of him. You know, it's, and it's a, it's a, it's those it's those simple acts of respect, right. I think. Right. Um, and uh, he was that way. He was always wonderful to me. And you know, I between the the pilot we did and then the next fifteen years um, of doing the show with him and with Bob Banner, who was who I worked for at that point, um, and. I guess the thing I did was I was able to introduce Mr. Sutton and Mr. Banner. Right. And Bob Banner was legendary television producer, and we had just he had just launched Star Search, which was a huge hit, and so the, so the marriage of those two. Um, and Bob did Candid Camera and the original Cal Burnett show, and just legendary television shows, and Bob Banner and Percy Sutton together were this powerful force and they became very good friends. Mm. Bob and his wife and Percy and, and his wife, when the first night Bob would be in town, the four, the, those four would go out to dinner together. And it was just their friendship. And, and, and uh, Bob and Alice loved the Suttons. And, and, and I think Bob came to town often just to have dinner with Percy Sutton. <laughs> yeah, because he, yeah, he, 
he knew he knew he had he, he wanted to hear those stories and he wanted to soak up that energy and the history that that, that man had yeah. it was great they're both a very you know similar bob was bob was brilliant and he had the most incredible stories i can only i wish i could have been you know a seat at that table mm. on those at those dinners hearing them compare you know M mr sutton was a tuskegee airman and bob was was one of the original directors of live television color black and white and, and then color in and, and his roots went back that far and the two you put those two minds those two creative minds together and you get showtime at the apollo mm, you know right, i think right. that we're so lucky to right. have had those two men who you know were there to leave by example bob was gentle he was a gentle giant and and uh never had to raise his voice but you knew what he needed you knew what he wanted and yeah, and you learn from his example right. very much very similar to mr Sutton. and the two those two together it was it was it, you know i was took a lot of pride out of the fact that i was the one who actually made the phone calls and got these two gentlemen together wow. and of course i was a young producer i just i just wanted to work but i fell in love with the apollo and and i felt so blessed to have the opportunity to to learn and grow as a young mm -hmm. producer director um in that environment and, right. you know the, what, what what people don't 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 know i think in the last the last episode you were telling us how you under under bob banner's wing you got to be uh groomed by him and you were given uh certain uh environments and, and certain you were exposed to certain things that 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 uh that that made you the person who you are today you know uh and just just by watching it and then him putting you inside those situations where you could actually become a part of it and actually take part into those situations and uh yeah and, that, you know i think i think that, that bob banner was similar what we just heard in the interview from mr sutton um similar in in, in many ways if bob believed in you mm -hmm. he was going to invest time and then put himself on the line with you and for you and, Right. Bob turned, you know, I stay close to Bob um, for for the rest of his life, really. And he was 92, I think he was 92. And I was at sitting with him having coffee at his retirement, you know, home that he lived at with his wife. This mm -hmm. beautiful place out in, in Woodland Hills, California. And by then I, you know, we were... I hadn't been working with him maybe for a decade or so, but, and I was now, I had, I was now one a more senior person just in the business. And I sat with him. I said, Bob, you know, I said, I would never, if I were you, I would never have hired me. To allow <laughs> me to He's got this job. And I mentioned one or two shows and I said, what were you thinking? You know, and he said, and I just said it like that with a, you know, with a smile like this. Right, like, what right, were you think? Right. Um, and he said, you know, he said, I knew that if I threw you in, you'd figure it out. Wow. And that was 92 year old Bob. And I met him, I think when he was 60. Mm -hmm. um, and he just believed not just in me, but you know, when he believed in you and he believed in, in, in an artist, mm -hmm. um, he believed in a producer, um, friend he he was the he was the person that got behind you and he taught me a lot i got a chance to to work for him right out of college and um and i spent many many hours and days with him helping him with projects and and of course back then as a 21 year old you're thinking why it's sunday afternoon how come i'm spending my entire day with my boss <laughs> at his house working <laughs> helping him organize or it was wednesday nights and all, and usually all day Sunday we work because I was helping him. Um, he was getting ready to, to teach a course at Northwestern University where I went, and I part of my job on the side, aside you know, outside of work hours, was to help him organize putting this course together. So right. um, back then it was like, oh, I, <clears throat> I really want to go, you know, hang out with my friends. I want to go, and and I a little bit resented it at the time because it was li literally every Sunday, <laughs> every right, Wednesday right. night. In hindsight, I got so many hours with him and and he invested it wasn't me helping him, he was investing his time in me. Wow. And I didn't realize I didn't it. Didn't realize it, yeah. And I learned so much, you know, in those hours together and would sit and listen to him on the phone. He'd be calling, you know, he was doing 
Perry Como holiday specials and talking to Frank Sinatra about this thing we're about to do. And I would sit quietly and listen to him and listen to how he treated, you know, everyone from me, a 21 year old kid, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from Long Island, New York, um, and how he treated Frank Sinatra. Right. And he treated us the same. The same he talked yeah. to us the same. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and I got to see that even the stars that he dealt with, how much they respected him and how much they appreciated him. Right. And, and that was a huge, huge life lesson to me that, you know, from Bob's, you know, point of view and Mr. Sutton's also, right. we're of all course. the same. Of course. We're of all course. the same. Right. I go and, back to, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And, and if you're going to put time in, I was willing to put those hours in, even right. if it was reluctantly at some time. Right, right make the effort and invest myself into, you know, to you, you're going to, you know, you're going to, I'm going to stand behind you and I'm going to help and I'm going to, and, you know, so the show, Showtime of the Apollo would not have been the same without Mr. Sutton and his vision, Bob Banner and his experience. And, um, you know, I was just so fortunate to be in a position to work on that show and, wow. and meet incredible people like you <laughs> and, and and uh, it was a very special time. It was a really yes, it special was. time for me. It launched my career. I learned. Yeah. I grew up, really grew up at the Apollo. Yeah. I learned everything I, I learned that would, you know, I would use the rest of my career. I learned at the right. Apollo Theater. And, so, and something that, that, that I think that, that, that sticks out to me is what, what Mr. Sutton said in that interview when the uh, interviewer asked him about why the Suttons and not the Joneses from down the street when they were on the same street. And I think he referred back to having a father figure and a family figure that taught him and pushed him and motivated him. So I want, I want I'm pretty sure that in your life you also had those same things uh to give to motivate you in the right way. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it really started um you know, we, we, when I went to, when I went to college, um, actually went to, uh, you and I have been friends for a long time. I'm not right. sure if I've ever mentioned it. Right. When I applied to college, you know, we were, uh, we were, we were not a, a well-to-do family, but, mm. and, and my decision of where to go to college had to do with where it was going to be cheapest to go to college. And, right. and I was back then, um, the vision for me was to be a doctor. And I was, I love science. I love math. I was one of those weird geeks that loved chemistry and loved, you know, physics and loved calculus. And, and I was going to be a doctor and I applied to Northwestern was one of the universities I applied to. They gave me a full scholar, pretty much full scholarship. Um, and, um, you know, growing up, you're not really you're kind of following a path. You're sort yeah. of following a predetermined path. Hopefully you find what you love and, you can head that direction. Right. I didn't realize that I actually wanted to work in TV and film until after I got accepted to, to Northwestern Done. and changed over to, to the film. You, and, could you hold that thought for just one second? Yeah. This yeah. is live, but nature's calling. <laughs> and I got to go. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> hold that thought for just one second. You guys, you know, this is live. So just hold on. I'll be right back. Okay. Hold on, Don. <laughs> uh, Joe and I both had uh, had dark hair together when we first met. We were both like we think we're about the same age. We were kids, and he was the young young uh, stagehand. And uh, the amazing thing, I don't know. I guess pro probably everyone that's on this. Uh, knows Joe Gray to a certain extent, but I was always amazed when we first started the show that, um, you know, the stage crew would work on the set and we would do rehearsals and, and, uh, and get ready to you know, let the audience in. And Joe would take off his stage hand, you know, clothes, put on his, his entertainer clothes and the show would start and he would warm up the house as a singer. And uh, especially when Ray Chu came on board, they would do, I 
don't know, 15, 20 minutes with the Apollo audience. And it was amazing. It was just amazing. And then, you know, he finished warming up. <laughs> wow. I'm telling a story about first time I saw you actually working as a stagehand, but then opening the show. And then he put back his work clothes on and then we would do the show. But he was, he was the man that got the night started. And wow. the whole wow. evening could have been just Joe Gray. And, and <laughs> was crew. Wow. And that was something that's entertaining. The sing-alongs and the, yeah. you know, just well, the amazing, amazing I, I was just, I was just so honored, you know, to, you know, to have been a part of that show, uh, you know, to have been featured on, you guys gave me an opportunity to, uh, to, to display my, my talents. And I, 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 I was, I was writing songs at that time and, I, I got a chance to 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 perform my own material on the show. The first time I performed on that show, I got a standing ovation. I was like, "What?" <laughs> it was crazy, man. I mean, you just don't know. And 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 the, the the big thing about about that was that my mother and my family got a chance to see that as a, as a, as a, as a young man growing up in North Carolina, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. That is Rocky Mount on the map. Um, home of Theolonius Monk, who I, I didn't even know about as a child because he wasn't in our history books at that time. I found out about Theolonius Monk when I came to New York. But growing up back then, my mother and my sisters would come to every one of my gigs, you know, and it just made, it just made the gigs better. And I don't even know how they found out where I was playing sometimes, but, you know, I looked out and there they were, you know. So to be on TV and one of the, the last images of, um, wow, my last show at the Apollo uh, my mother got a chance to 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 see to see that you know my my, my last the last my last performance. Uh, I I don't know if you noticed, but they 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 changed my name at the Apollo from you know I was being introduced as Joe Gray, but then they wanted to call me the Set It Off Man. I mean right. I mean without asking me anything, they just came say you know this is this is what it's going to be now. Okay, I didn't like that, so. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, when, when, at, when I would end the show, I would say, they called me to set it off, man, but my mother, my mother Mary Gray, named me Joe Gray. So that's where that came from, you know? And so, yeah. so, so my mother was a, was a big influence, in, you know, I mean, she actually told me how to hold my drumsticks when, 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 I, when, when she bought me my first, when she bought me my first drum set. She showed me how to hold my drumsticks, you know? That's how much of an influence she was in my life, you know? So uh, I, I lost a great friend uh, a few a few months back, but I know that that she's smiling on us right now because you know she knows that I'm, I'm doing the thing, man. Well, okay, so let's 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 move on. We 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 talked about um, Bob Banner's influence on you, and I, I remember doing our conversation before you was, you had spoken about him being at the Apollo and with uh, uh, Natalie Cole, I think. With the, yeah, yeah, Natalie yeah. Cole when she was little, when she yeah. was a. Uh, you know, probably in, I don't know, elementary school, because he worked with Nat King Cole. Mm -hmm. And the night, the first night, I, I think I told the story last time, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, how I got involved with it, with the Apollo, was I was in New York the night that they relaunched Wednesday Night Amateur Night. Mm. And at the end of the newscast, the newscaster said, and as we leave you tonight, I'm gonna leave, we're going we're gonna to show you some scenes from the world-famous Apollo Theater, and their first amateur night in uh, probably a decade, good night. And they rolled credits and there was, there were clips from the Wednesday night amateur show. And I saw audience, the audience was booing and there was this gentleman in a suit with like a rainbow fright wig with a chair chasing someone off the stage. And it was just like, it was mayhem. Mm. And the audience had a great time. And I thought in that like 30 seconds that I saw it, I thought that, that, that needs to be on television. <laughs> I called Bob Banner immediately. And um, he said, oh, yeah, I used to go to the Apollo all the time with, when I worked with Matt King Cole in New York. And we used to go hang, we used to go watch shows. Yeah, so, and I said, what should I do? And he said, well, why don't you find out, anyway, uh, find out about the theater, find out what's happening. So I, I, I called the box office and made, worked my way up to Mr. Sutton's office and we had just launched the company that I worked for Bob Banner Associates had just launched Star Search a year or so earlier and Star Search was a huge hit and so 
it wasn't me calling. I was calling as someone that works for Bob and Associates, right, the producers right. of Sponsor. Anyway, so I got, I managed, I, I worked, I used that to get into a room with Mr. Sutton and that how the, how our relationship with him began. But then uh, we sold it. We sold the show. We had to do a pilot, uh, one, a sample episode so that the local stations around the country could see what the show was going to be. And um, we look, we needed a host and Bob remembered Nat and Natalie, little Natalie. And mm. Natalie has, was taking sort of a hiatus from her career at this point. She had some personal issues that she was working through and took some time away from her, you know, this hit music career that she had. And he said, we should call Natalie because we should find, we should have someone host the show as a connection, a real connection to the Apollo. So Natalie Cole came in, you know, she hadn't been on the scene for four or five years um, professionally. Right. And um, Bob talked about Nat and the Apollo and she loved the idea. And, and he said, you know, you should do the show with us, this pilot episode. But he said, I want you to sing with your dad. And she said, "What? You know, Bob is a musician. He lit, he led big bands when he was in college. He's an incredible musician at his core." And he said, "No, I want you to sing uh, harmonies with your father." And she said, "Well, I don't know that. How do I do that?" And so he pulled out a film cl a clip from one of his old shows with Nat King Cole. Yeah, put it in the machine and played it. So it's Bob and Natalie and I are sitting in Bob Banner's office in Los Angeles. And uh, Nat was singing Too Young. Mm. And Natalie was watching and he said, and when they hit the first instrumental break, Bob said, now you come in here. Mm. And she looked at him like, what? What are you? Are you crazy? What are you talking about? <laughs> but Bob, was, he's a musician. So he explained. And then Nat came back in. He said, now you're going to sing harmonies. You're going to sing on top of your dad here. Wow. You're going to have harmonies. And then Nat had a solo section. And then there was an instrumental break and Bob said, you're going to come back in here. And she said, okay, you know, I'll try it. I'll try it. So on the, on the pilot, and that was way, that was decades before Unforgettable. Wow. Um, and Bob had this, because of his relationship with Nat King Cole and because he loved, you know, he knew Natalie's a six-year-old. Um, he convinced her to try it on the pilot. And we had dancers and we, you know, we, did this arrangement, this medley with, with Natalie. And it was, it's what got the show on television. Wow. Really, is, Nat, is Natalie Cole's performance. Whoa. Cause you could see the, the possibilities. Yeah. And, and well, check, it was, it was, check, check, check this out. There's a clip from the pilot. I think yeah. there's a clip. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Not seen it yet. Yeah, here it comes, I think. Many dreams have been brought to your doorstep, and they just lie there, and they die there.
Yeah, how about that, man? Well, brought back a lot of memories. So, you know, that was Natalie agreeing to do that. That until then, you know, Natalie was a pop. She was a pop R and B star, and it kind of re kind of reintroduced the notion of singing classics. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, unforgettable. She, right. You know, her 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 life changed, and she made some amazing music you know, singing her dad's, singing with her dad. And it just, I, that was, you know, Bob's inspiration right. is what, and you know, is what started uh, that. Well, started speaking that of, movie. well, speaking of singing with her dad, I got, I got a little surprise for you too. You ready? Okay. Check this out. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, this is Don Weiner's daughter, Allison, who's getting ready to perform for you.
done. You yeah. must be proud, brother. She's an incredibly talented kid, and you know, she won The Voice that year. Yes. Um, yes. She was on Christine Aguilera's team, and yeah, she's all her talent comes from her mother. Um, <laughs> but she probably, you know, it kind of my uh, my wife Laura was a Broadway singer dancer, and she a teacher, um, and uh, you know that that a little bit of a avocation of the family, so. Um, yeah, we're really proud of Allison. She's amazing. My other daughter, Jordana. Okay. Um, we're going to go through the family just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. She just graduated with a master's from Harvard. She's a teacher, just starting to teach. Oh, wow. And amazing kid, just on. She got all the brains. <laughs> the family. Okay. Let's see what we got <laughs> next. Yes. Uh, oh, that's you and I and, and Marcus. Yeah, Marcus King. Yeah, let's go. Let's go back with him for just a second. See what we got yeah. here. Marcus King. How did you and he and Marcus hook up? Well, Marcus was, you know, everyone knows him as uh, as the brains. Uh, I don't want to be negative in any way, but but the inspiration behind J.B. Fox. He was Jamie Fox's manager and partner for many, many, many years. Okay. Um, helped Jamie um, really launch his career. But I met him when he managed uh, Mark Curry, wow. who was the second host of Showtime with the Apollo. Right, right. And Mark hosted the show, I think, for about three years. So I got to spend a lot of time with Marcus. Super talented, mm -hmm. um, insightful manager, producer, executive, um, and we just stayed very close over the years. He was, Marcus, a story that I'm not sure, I'm sure he's told this story many times, but he was uh, at the Apollo the night that Jamie, Jamie Fox came on um, and did stand up at the mm. Apollo. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and he got booed off. Wow. It was a brand new, just launching his career, and Jamie was back. And Marcus was backstage, and and uh, sat with Jamie, and you know, and Mark, uh, again, I'm paraphrasing. I don't want to, you know, recreate history too much, but but um, Marcus got. We gave Marcus a, a tape, a VHS tape, of Jamie's performance, and we never put these comics who got booed, you know, off on TV, but we we, we gave. The tape to Marcus. He sat with Jamie the next day and watched the tape mm -hmm. and um, gave him advice. You know, hey, this is this works. Hey, this you need. We need to think about this. You need. Right. To, you need to think about this. They right. weren't partners at that point. Right. And he really helped um, launch Jamie Fox's career. Um, and you know, Jamie, super. You know, one of the most talented entertainers ever. Um, and Marcus helped him, you know, with that rise. And right, right. He, he taught him and he, he stayed with him and, and, you know, they, we did so many great things together. Marcus, I called, you know, uh, after Shelter Time of the Apollo was off the air for a few years, um, I was dying to get back to the Apollo to do something. And, um, I called Marcus and said, Hey, you know, we should go back and do a show. Let's go back and do a show, you, me, and Jamie. And so the three of us um, put together a show for uh, BET called Apollo Live. Hmm. And Marcus, Jamie, and I exec produced it and ran a couple of seasons on BET. Um, uh, Tony Rock was the host. Right, I know. Super yeah, yeah. talented. Yeah. Tony's an incredibly really, really, talented yeah. 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 host. I mean, I'm so impressed with, with him. And so, yeah, Marcus and I, we've done a lot of things together over the years and brilliant, brilliant executive and so accomplished and, and uh, yeah, but he's, he was there, you know, even though he was back in the early days, in some ways he was only, he was, you know, only the manager right. for, wow. for Mark Curry, but he was much more, more than that. And yeah. hands on and his insights yeah. and yeah. what he contributed and, and, what he contributed to Mark because Mark was an amazing host and had a, has had a great career and still ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Mark is just one of the people I just 
you know, I love and really respect right. him and his judgment and talent. And we still talk often. And when I, you know, need something, I'll pick up the phone. And, and yeah. so that's, just, that's great. Just stay connected with talk yeah. once. So Don, I just want to say this has been great, man. Um, I'm sure that people who are, who are watching this have been not only entertained, but thoroughly uh, given a, a history lesson that, that you can't get anywhere. And I, I know that inside of that brain of yours is a lot, lot more. So right now I'm going to give, just before we end the show, if you want to call in to ask Don a question, uh, I thought I had the numbers down below, but I don't think I do anymore. But it's 646-209-7946. That's the number that you call in to ask questions. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, 646-209-7946. Uh, I'm just going to wait like uh, 30 seconds. Nobody calls in. Say la vie. Because <laughs> I might have to go to the bathroom again. No, nah, <laughs> that was crazy, man. Well, you got to go. You got to go. <laughs> uh, this, this is a story. Huh? I got to sneak in a story about that, you. That was great. Gone. I'll have to listen to it. I definitely have to listen to it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, but you know, while, while, while we're waiting for someone to call in, I want to give a shout out to those who who did, who are listening. Uh, Donna Lewis, Latoire Gooden, my niece, uh, Karen Anderson has been been holding us down for a minute, and I want to give a special shout out to a young man. I'm going to come back to him. Liz Smiley Bayez is in with us. Karen Anderson again. Brother C.P. Lacey, who's the executioner for Showtime at the Apollo, you know? Hey, C.P. What's up? Don is waving at you, C.P. Uh, yeah. Who else? Michelle Cox, married, single, and, and everything in between. Yes. Yes. Who else is in there with us? I, and I want to give a shout. You just touch my homeboy. Okay. I got, we, 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 got, we got a phone call coming in. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hello? Hello? Hi, who's calling? Hi, this is Latoya Gooden. Oh, this is my niece. Can't, I can't get <laughs> Hi, rid of my family. Girl. I can't get rid of my family. What's up, girl? <laughs> Hi. Hi, Mr. Dawn. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I have a quick question. My question is, okay. what advice would you give a young producer who's coming to the industry? Uh, what advice would you um, give them that... You, you wish that somebody would have gave you when you first started? Um, you know, I think the most important thing maybe that I've, that I've learned um, in, in, cause the producer has, you know, producer has, has different roles. If you're a producer who is, you know, originating original ideas, ideas that you're, you're passionate about and trying to get on, on television or on film versus if you're a producer who's executing someone else's vision. Um, but what I, what I have learned is you need to a couple things. I could probably go off for hours. <laughs> you need to, you need to do what you know and you need to first be open to and, 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 and watch and listen and, you know, not just watch other people's shows, but just life, just the world around you. And, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're into, you know, music and, and that, that type of thing, that type of show or comedy or whatever, open yourself up to, to the world so that you're learning and growing and developing, you know, developing opinions, developing things you love, developing an understanding of what you don't like and, and find, find projects that you're passionate about, you know, projects that you, that, that um, you're going to pursue that you just need to make happen and and it's that it's when it comes from that 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 place of passion where first you're gonna you're gonna see the project more clearly you're gonna develop the project in a more full way because you're because it's 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 something that you believe in something that 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 um means something to you you know it's mm -hmm. hard it's easy interest. It's easy to, you know, someone can give you a, a script or a one line idea for a show and you can, it's easy to say, okay, I can, I think I can develop that and I can sell that. But 
in your heart of hearts, is that what you really want to do? Mm. And right. when you find the topics that are that you're passionate about, that you believe in, when you are pushing them, when you're either talking to talent who you want to be involved or to financial people or to studios or networks, and you're trying to explain why they need to take on your project, when it comes from a place of passion, um, they're going to get it. They're going to mm -hmm. maybe buy because of your passion. They're going to be more open to, mm -hmm. to believing in it because you honestly believe and you you can you can you're just getting them you're just you're doing them a favor letting them get on the train with you, you know, I've, I've gone out i've gone out and pitched shows that i believe in and i've pitched shows that i kind of believed in, that were more just for finance or because you feel like okay i, I got to sell something so we're gonna you know i'm gonna go out and pitch this or that and um i tell you when it, it's so much easier to to i, I the word sell is a bad word, um, but sell when you're going to, you're going to try to sell your vision, sell that idea. If you honestly, in your core, believe it and you honestly feel like, wow, that's fascinating to me because I would love to see that. And now as a producer, you know, producers are essentially in some ways, um, you're just a viewer who's taking control. You're mm -hmm. saying, you know what? I believe in this idea. I can mm -hmm. see it because I want to. This is how I see it on television, or this is how I see it on on a big screen in a movie theater. Um, you're essentially you're you're looking for um, projects that turn you on, that make you excited to get up in the morning, and make you want to make those ten extra phone calls um, mm -hmm. to to drum up support and to, and also to, 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 to justify you spending the hours you're going to spend at the computer writing it. You know, I, I, I probably spent in my career more hours writing ideas mm -hmm. than I have actually producing ideas because yeah. sometimes it takes hours and hours mm -hmm. of thought and, mm -hmm. and reflection and introspection and, and, um, you know, generally as a, as, as a, as a producer, the projects that I've gotten behind and managed to help get on television, it generally has taken me an average of two years per project. Mm. You know, my wow. first call to Mr. Sutton was in, I think it was in 1980, it was sometime probably 1985. We didn't shoot the pilot to the fall of 86. And then January of 87, we were selling it to local stations and it premiered in the fall of the September of 87. So I've been passionate. I fell in love with the Apollo and what happens there two and a half years before I actually got to see the show on the air. Um, and, you know, at, but I believed in it and I mm. stuck with it. I wasn't going to let anyone tell me that this show should not be right, right. on television. Right. And that's, and that's kind of been the average what I've seen just, and again, this is not scientific. This is just what I've experienced in my, over my, you know, last 30 years, it kind of takes a couple of years. And in order to, um, persevere and, and at the end of that two years, when someone says, Hey, what are you working on? Or what do you have for me? You need to be able to come with that enthusiasm as if it's brand new. Mm. You can't say, well, mm -hmm. I've been trying to do this for two years. And it's a <laughs> this, and that, and if not, I'm going to give up. You know, it's got to be. You know what? The, I just saw the most. I I just saw the most amazing thing. I, now I may have seen it two and a half years ago, but when I'm in that meeting with that executive who has the ability to push my project forward, it's got to be as I've got to be as present and as excited and as you know, uh, as in the just in the moment at that point as I was when I first got inspired. So as a right. producer, you can't, you can't make that up. You can't convince yourself to be inspired. You can't convince yourself to be passionate. Right. And so find, so, so trust in your, your instinct and, 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 um, you know, as a producer and you, again, this is just my point of view, you're working 24 seven, you know, when I'm in the shower in the morning, I'm, 
I'm thinking through what I need to do that day, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's Monday mm -hmm. or whether it's Sunday. And it's, and it, that's hard. That's easier to do when you're excited about what you're trying to get done. And when you really believe in what you're trying to get done, right. um, cause it's tough, you know, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle getting projects going. It's really, really, it's, it's not easy. That's why I'm, I was telling uh, Joe earlier, you know, I'm so happy for him and so proud of the fact that he's doing this podcast and he's yeah. launching something. New. It's a whole new venture for him, but he believes in it and he's, he's doing the work and, 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 uh, you know, he's got the passion for it and that's, what's going to make this podcast successful. And as a producer, you got to believe, hmm. you know, you got it. You got to, you got to, um, and not, not just because, again, I hate to say sell, but not just so you could sell it, but so that 10 years down the road, for me, it was 15 years down the road doing Showtime with Apollo. I felt pretty, you know, I felt like, okay, this is a, there's no, 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 um, nothing from, there's no light shining down on me. There's no one's interviewing me at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to be part of creating something. And it helped launch careers and it helped, you know, it helped um, people put, you know, food on the table. And then it, it, and it grew out of a passion that I felt, something that I saw. And I recognized it first, Bob Banner seconded it. And then when I met Mr. Sutton, it was like, okay, we're, we're doing this. Mm -hmm. we're do and, and it wasn't any, it wasn't any manufactured love or, or excitement. It was, a, it was, it was real. Right. And as a producer, finding finding what you believe in, and then going and stick sticking with it, because you're going to get you know we we sold um, the idea to do a show at the Apollo uh, was originally with 20th Century Fox with Fox 20th Century Fox Syndication. They had another vision for it, um, and it wasn't what we wanted to do, and. So we kind of wasted nine months, you know, waiting on them. And then we went out and sold it again to find it, found someone else who believed in it. And if we did, if we, Bob Banner, Percy Sutton, Inner City Broadcasting, which, you know, was Mr. Sutton's company, my, my core people, if we didn't all believe in it, we would have given up. When that, mm -hmm. when that, when Fox, the Fox deal went away, we would have said, oh, well, we tried, let's move on to something that's going to, because no, no one, we, no one's getting paid. We didn't get paid for that first year and a half. Wow. Um, so, so at that point you go, you think, okay, I'm going to, I need to go get a job. I got young kids. I got, you know, it, or do you, do you, do you think, okay, they just, Fox just said no after a year and a half or nine months, am I going to walk away? Or how much do I want this? How much do mm -hmm. we as a group want this? And believe in it. Do we believe in it? Right, right, right. We, we all believed right, in right. it. And there was not even a moment's hesitation. I think we got the message from Fox. And, you know, within the next blink of an eye, we were out there again because we believed in it. Uh -huh. And so as a producer, you know, producer is so many different things. But, but at, at its core, it's someone who has a project and is going to find a way to make it happen right. and just watch me. You know, wow. That's a bit. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Great yeah. question. Yeah. That's a great question. Great question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, you can hang up now. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say, uh, let's give thanks uh, to brother Don Weiner again for, 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 um, you know, giving us so many great jewels of knowledge and 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 uh, wisdom. Uh, I'm 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 just honored to be your friend. Uh, but I forgot. There's one person in this in this chat room that I really have to pay homage to, and that's Joseph E. Whedon the third. Had it I not mean. been yeah, had it not been for him, I would not be at the Apollo. I want. I just want to let everybody know that Joseph Whedon is the is the reason why. I stepped foot into the Apollo to work there. He, at that time, was a was a, 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 a production manager at the Apollo, and we had been out. We met together on the road when I was with Cameo, and 
you know, we met again in New York and, and I gave him my number and he called me and the rest is history. And I, I just want to tell you, Joe, that I love you, you know, for being a friend back then and, and always, you know, sticking up for me and, and talking about my Volkswagen, get trashing my Volkswagen while I'm riding you home in it <laughs> on the FDR drive. Cause I didn't have any, uh, well, yeah, I forgot. I forgot what it was, but anyway, we were, we were bumping down the, uh, the FDR drive on the way home, but those are great, great memories. And I want to thank you. And I want to tell you that I love you brother for, for the inspiration and, um, you know, and the opportunity, you know, I wouldn't be there had it not been for you. And I wouldn't have met this, this amazing young man. So, and so Latoire, if you're still listening, you know, I came to, to your home first with this, with this equipment. I had, I hadn't even taken it out of the box. Uh, I had a vision about doing a podcast. My very first podcast was with you, Latoire, and your story about being a woman in the Navy and not even knowing how to swim when you first got there. And now you are a commander in the Navy. And I applaud you, young lady. Now, that's your stick to it in this and what Don was talking about when you have a vision and, and dream. You're producing now with your, with, your clothes, with your clothing line. So everybody, go check out Latoire. You know, fashion lines you can you can check out online. I'll I'll, I'll give you the, the hook up with that. But once again, let's say thank you everybody to my man Don Weiner. I want to thank everybody that joined in tonight. Good night. God bless you. And Joe Crazy is going to take us out with uh, speak less again. Goodbye. Good night. You're in the spotlight. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Well, Joe Crazy is not doing it, huh? Let it die out just to piggyback off it. Tell me about myself and how I must attract. I want to thank you all for listening tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoy what you heard. Uh, we're going to do this again, not every Wednesday. I'm going to do this when I got the shows right. I'm going to spend the time to get the shows right so you can be entertaining and be entertained properly. I'm not going to promise you that this is going to be every Wednesday. This is going to be when the show is right. Okay? I love you all. Thank you. Listen to my son. Good night. You've just been in the spotlight. Thank you so very much.